Hello and welcome. My name is John Lawless. I'm the Director of Percussion Studies at Kennesaw State University. This is the fifth and final installment of our week-long summer music program, albeit um, video submissions, since we're all still quarantined. Um, anyway, I've been at Kennesaw State uh, since 1998. It's been one of the joys of my life to teach percussion to um, basically 17, 18-year-olds through their undergraduate degree and send them on into the world. Um, and I've been collecting instruments the better part of my life. There's actually a picture of me playing a drum at two years of age. I don't think I knew what I was doing, but I'm sure that sparked an interest that, uh, that, that or maybe lit a fire that has stayed to this day. And I just had my 60th birthday in December. So that gives you an idea of how long I've been around this world of percussion. <laughs> I've been seriously collecting things since uh, probably when I was in college. So quite a few years. I'm going to share with you. We're in my studio now at home. <clears throat> it's attached to our house. And uh, I'm going to share with you some of the things I've collected. And, I, you know, I thought I could do many different facets of this video. we got about 45 minutes. Uh, we could have done timpani or snare drum or mallets. And I have all that stuff in here as well. Uh, but I think the world stuff is a little more universal, obviously. And... Um, it's fun. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, at the end of my percussion techniques class, every semester that I teach that class at KSU, we do a what's called a salsa day. We do have salsa, but I just bring in things, three van loads of stuff, and we just pull it in, and we all have a good time. And uh, this is sort of that. Okay, it's a it's a video presentation. You're obviously not live. <clears throat> We're quarantined still. Uh, and I hope that's gone okay for everyone. Uh, it's allowed me to spend more time with my personal family. Uh, that's been incredible. Um, and it's also allowed me time to spend kind of one-on-one -on -one time with my, my drum family, which I do enjoy so much. So anyway, let's get started. Uh, I would love to say if there are any questions, uh, go ahead and hit me, but that's not possible, is it? If you do have questions, seriously, I didn't think about this until right now, contact me. You'll find my email probably here on the site at the end of our presentation. Um, any questions on KSU, I'm sure there'll be a link. You can check that out. One of the earliest drums, you're probably thinking, that looks like a really simple drum, John. It is. This is just a tar. <clears throat> and this is a very, very simple one. Made by Remo. It's got a plastic head on it, which most of my drums have skinned heads. And I keep it that way because that's what I prefer. But this drum I bought, oh, one of my first in my collection, literally, and it's still around. The head has remained fine. And I keep it because of uh, two reasons. One, I like to show it to people. And two, I just like to play it. So this has a hole, as you can see right there, and you can put your thumb in there. And then you suspend the drum into your left hand if you're right-handed. Get a low sound. You get near the end, you get a high sound. What I love about this drum and the way this head works is that if I put pressure on it with my hands, I can bend it. Check this out. So that just makes that drum unique as far as being able to bend the pitch. That idea has been all over the world of, of drums and percussion. Just a animal skin head, if you will, stretched over some sort of a frame. Uh, this drum is very similar to the tar, however, it's got snares inside. You can see them, just little pieces of string that are embedded into the, the back side of the head. This is called a bendir from Northern Africa. And I literally found this, strangely enough, in an antique shop, and it was used as a lampshade. And it was sitting on top of a lamp, and it had a price tag hanging off of here, and I forget the price at this point. But I offered them just a little bit under that price just to get the shade. And when they told me they didn't want to separate the two, I'm thinking to myself, those two do not belong together. It is not a lampshade. And I saw that it was a drum because of this little snare thing. So anyway, again, you have that hole there. And I, same idea as the tar, that you play it with your hands, but you get that wonderful buzzing sound. So this drum, uh, has another way that it can be played. And I'm not sure how authentic this is, though I think it's slightly authentic. Uh, I was in California at a convention playing this drum in a booth, and this guy walks up, a Middle Eastern fellow, and he says, oh, you know you know about the Bendir? And I, uh, I said, oh, a little bit. <laughs> I enjoy it, though. So I'm playing it, and he starts to play, and we're jamming, right? And he 
goes. And my I'm sure my eyes got really big. That, that was a technique that makes it sort of like a wah-wah. And you're just flipping it around your thumb, and it ends up coming back, and you continue playing. So the bendier uh, became one of my favorite drums at that very second, actually. So that idea, a single head stretched over a frame, if you jump on over to Ireland, <laughs> you have this drum. The Balron, Bodron, Boron, I've heard it pronounced a lot of different ways. It has a cross piece in the, in the back there you can hang on to. Um, not necessary, you can literally play the Boron. Um, if you don't have that cross piece, you just stick it like towards your body and you play it. This drum can be played like a tar. You don't need the tipper. You can, you can actually make all kinds of wonderful sounds on it. Non-traditional Irish. If you talk about the Irish jigs and reels, this is the traditional drum they would use. They do use uh, a stick, a stick, not two like we with every other uh, drum that we have in our collection that requires sticks. In, uh, in Ireland, it's one stick called the tipper. This is my favorite one. I've just beat the tar out of this for years and years and years. I'm starting to lose the edges. Um, but it's a wonderful balance. Uh, you hold it like you hold a pencil and you flick it with a rotation feel with your, uh, with your wrist there. I want to show you one thing about this that's unique. And very simple. A lot of times with percussion instruments, there are several today in this presentation that you'll see where you, you make one sound and you get two sounds for that one motion. Uh, this is something that, that goes along those lines. On this drum, if I play it just a regular rhythm with the beater facing down, and you can get a strike down and a strike up. But the back of the tipper is the magic. So without changing anything at all, except the position of the tipper itself, listen to the sound of the rhythm that actually splits off. So if I have this, now watch. What's happening in slow motion is that tipper is actually coming back. So all I do is position my hand slightly differently in all of those, what we would call triplets. Uh, in Ireland, sometimes they call it the roll. If you want to mute the drum down, you can use, like I said earlier, your body, and you can actually change a bit with your hand inside. And all I'm doing there is just applying pressure, uh, like I did with the tar when I changed that pitch. So that's the Boran, the B-O-D-H-R-A-N, Baldron, Bodron, Boran, you can say it however you like, I promise you, I've heard many people pronounce that many different ways, all thinking that was the authentic way to say it, so I'm just going to give them that. Another instrument from Ireland, can be found a lot of different places now, certainly in mountain music, uh, but we think it came from Ireland, actually, so this is just a set of spoons. And a spoon's very simple. Uh, it's just a spoon. The spoon part's facing in. You can use regular spoons where you would have the spoon part this way. Uh, hold them with your hand and play them that way. I don't have any in here, but you could see. You can try it. Grab some spoons out of your kitchen. Uh, when I first uh, received these, I just listened to some Irish recordings, some Celtic music, and I played them just like this. Um, we have a group called the Atlanta Percussion Trio, and we have played school shows for well over 40 years now. And you never know where you're going to learn your next uh, incredible thing, uh, and I'm wide open to that, believe me. I was playing the Spoons one, one year in a school, and this little eight-year-old second grader walked up to me at the end of our show. We'd already finished playing. I'd played them like this. And she walked up to me and she said, hello, John. And I said, yes. And she said, may I see your spoons, please? And her teacher let her come up. And I said, what's your name? She said, Sarah. So I handed her my spoons and Sarah said this to me, which I did not expect. May I show you how to really play them? <laughs> and she had a bit of an accent, so I knew I was in trouble. She was from Ireland. She was eight years old. She was a second grader. And she was an amazing spoon player. I had done this. And she did this. So in about 10 seconds, I realized I knew very little or really nothing about spoons, and she was quite proficient. So she told me, the triplet, you hit your palm, get that sound. 
Very simple, and you also can use your fingers really wide and use them like little ridges. Anywhere you tap, anywhere you tap, you get different timbres because of the way your body is and because of the way the spoons react. Last thing we'll do in Ireland here, <clears throat> and this has been a very cool thing to, to experiment with over the years. Uh, these are bones. These are actual authentic bones. You can have, I've got literally a whole bag of bones over there that are made of wood, uh, different hardnesses, different shapes. They all sound great. Uh, let me just show you how bones work. And again, that motion where you do one motion to get a couple of sounds is about to come into play once again. So like the tipper with the baron, this bone you will put, and they're, again, they're going to be facing out like that. Let me start with that. So they'll face out like this. Put this bone against the fleshy part of your, of your hand, of your palm there, and you're kind of fixing it into place between your first finger and your thumb. So now that's kind of a fixed entity. This one I'm going to insert between my ring finger and my middle finger. And I line them up. Okay, so it's a little bit weird at first because that one's kind of a dangling bone. Uh, what you want to do, though, is have them spaced so you have them a finger width apart. And if you snap forward, <clears throat> you get the sound of the bones clicking together. <clears throat> That's your first thing you want to do. It's kind of similar to uh, fishing. If you throw in a fishing lure uh, with the fishing rod, it's that snapping idea. <clears throat> and when I relax, watch this. Now that sound is happening because this bone is loose and it's kind of coming back and flopping onto the fixed bone. So it's just an amazing, um, simple, but you gotta work on it a little bit. And you can get on videos now. You can just watch YouTube after YouTube video of incredible bone players <laughs> playing these Celtic bones, um, wood, and also the, the bone shapes. And it's just uh, an amazing, amazing situation. Okay, we're going to go to small stuff now. And some of the easiest things, some of the bread and butter, literally, of percussionists are some of the things we kind of... Uh, don't practice because who's going to practice a shaker? Well, everybody should, literally. So I remember having a lesson with my teacher, Jack Bell. This is uh, many, 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 many moons ago. And he would show me shaker technique. And I thought, oh my gosh, really? And then you realize, as soon as you get on a gig and they want you to play a shaker where it's consistent and it's in good time and has an accent or... multiple accents, you realize how weird you can feel if you don't know how to play these things. So let me show you a couple things. This is a really uh, easy to control shaker. It's, you know, it's got facets, which is great. This is a larger version, there are smaller versions. Uh, so it's easy to play the accents. And all you have to think about when you're doing that, we'll do this very quick, is think about an, an ending, like you're hitting a wall, and there's your accent. So if you're playing just a front wall, you have a back one, you just freeze it back here. Okay? Very simple. You don't want any accent solved, you just don't accent. You can make it sound a little bit rounder, you can actually angle this a little bit. I learned this from a buddy of mine, Steve Hemphill. And he had a squared off shaker and he was making it sound super round. I thought, how did you do that? And he just said, you're kind of sliding the, the, the shot inside. So you can kind of round that out. Simple techniques. But keep it parallel, parallel to the floor. Here's another one. And these are round, so less likely to have a nice sharp accent. Wrong. If you just go forward. Very simple. And these are unique in that you can go with one or the other, or you can combine them. So LP had a good idea with that, especially for people that record. And you can do a lot of recording with something as simple as a shaker. I guarantee it. All right, let's see. Let me look at my list so I don't get lost in like my, my, uh, my thought process here. I did make a little cheat sheet there uh, just to sort of stay on task. So these are maracas. These are very nice maracas. These are from uh, Venezuela, tapas. Uh, 
And this is one of those, uh, the next item where you do one motion and you get two sounds. So I just go straight up and down based on my timing. If I just go da 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 da, I get da 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 Right? The Horoko style. There's a specialist here in town. He, strangely enough, plays bass player in the Atlanta Symphony, uh, Alcides Rodriguez. And he's a Morocco guru. He's an expert. And um, he is also a supplier of Morocco. It's not to plug him, but he wouldn't mind it, I'm sure. Uh, the whole idea of using the seeds inside. And there's many, many, many different techniques with the maracas. So if you're interested in Venezuelan maracas, don't just watch this video. Go deeper. Go way deeper. If you just jump on, put Joropo Maraca plane from Venezuela, you will get uh, a lifetime of things to work on. And it's just one of the most incredible things as far as using the seeds inside. Uh, and these are the best you can buy, by the way, the tapas uh were the standards for, oh, I don't know how many years. And they still, if you can find them, they are still uh, basically the, the Rolls Royces, if you will, of, um, of Maracas. Okay, let me show you something that, that blew my mind. Trio show, years ago now. Uh, at the end of our shows, we will always hand instruments to kids. We have buckets of instruments. And we'll do a big parade at the end of our shows with, you know, 50 people following us and we're running around the room and playing whatever from wherever. Uh, there's always something you can uh, find boatloads of percussion instruments to fit with. So I handed a kid in a middle school out in Gwinnett County, close to here, uh, a cowbell and a stick. And when you hand someone, uh, you assume they don't know what they're doing, so you just show them how to play. So... I did that, I handed it to him. He was standing behind me. I'm playing a shake ray, which we'll get to that in a second. And uh, we're going around the room, and the next thing I realized was behind me was the sound of a cowbell in perfect time with the rhythm I'd never heard come out of a cowbell before with one stick. And I looked behind me, and this kid, sixth grader, is doing this. I'm sure my eyes popped out, and we got through with the parade, and I said to him, I'd love to talk to you about your cowbell playing afterwards, so he hung back, and we were packing down, and I said, that was incredible. How did you know that? And um, he said, well, I'm just my, my uncle, my, my father, everyone, you know, and he had just grew up with it, like Sarah with the, the spoons, and I was like, good heavens, what's your name? He, his last name was Santana. <laughs> I don't think any relation, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Anyway... Okay, let me see where I'm going to go next. Um, yeah, we'll go here. We'll go here. Okay. So check it out. This is what we would call the pretty typical Western orchestral tambourine. This is the Black Swamp. It's one of the, one of the flagships now that you can buy. I've got a lot of them right now. Take it into symphony. Take it into your wind ensemble or orchestra. And all the techniques that you would do on tambourine. Normally they're all based on playing it this way, okay? So if you go around the world and check out tambourines, you see versions like this rick. This is a, a Middle Eastern instrument. Uh, beautiful workmanship here. The mother of pearl inlay uh, and some bone, I think. It's just, it's just wonderful. You don't have to play this tambourine like this. You play it up. And just like the, the tar or the bandier, you play it up like this. So very much finger oriented. And you can also manipulate the jingle. This one has a sturgeon skin, a, a fish skin head. So again, you can manipulate the sound. So 
many different sounds, using the jingles, using the drum, using your fingers, using different places on the drum head. Uh, beautiful little instrument. This is a Rick R.I.Q. Love that one. Now, another tambourine type instrument is this one. It's going to take us into our next segment. Uh, this is actually a Pandero from Brazil. Again, jingles, a frame, a head. Uh, this is a natural skin head. Uh, one of my favorite percussionists on the planet is a buddy of mine, Rafael Pereira Hafa, and uh, he picked this out for me. This is another gorgeous example of workmanship. Look at this. This is made by Cooperman. Uh, the jingles are custom. And instead of having two, there are three. There's one in the middle that sole purpose is to kind of mute the other, uh, the, the, the ring of the jingles. So, uh, for instance, okay, let me just show you this. If I wanted to take uh, this instrument and make it a Pandero, it wouldn't work. It rings too much. It's just too much. Adversely, if I took this instrument, which is one of the nicest you can find, of the Pandero variety of tambourines, uh, into symphony with ASO, let's say I'm playing Prokofiev or whatever, let's say I'm playing Tchaikovsky. <laughs> it does not sound good. Uh, it's not supposed to be played that way. So if you play this in a Pandero um, technique, you're gonna get. So you can mute and unmute the head. I mentioned Raphael a moment ago, uh, if you want to learn how to play Pandero, and this is um, something I'll be learning for the rest of my life. I, st I still do not have it down. I know the basic techniques. I literally will be playing this and practicing this instrument until I take my last breath. I'm sure of it. Um, wonderful instrument. A lot of the techniques uh, you would you would do that you, you've sort of worked on with traditional Western tambourine playing, but but it's um, it's just magnified to the umpteenth. Uh, Raphael can play this where it sounds like a little drum set. So nonetheless, that's the Pandero, another way to play tambourine other than what we are normally used to. So you have the Rick, you have the Pandero. All right, now we're in Brazil, and I'm anxious that we're here. We're going to start jumping around. <clears throat> Let me show you one of the coolest things ever. I know, I've probably said that a few times already. And I'm not kidding this time. I wasn't kidding those other times either. Uh, this is called a bed and bow. And my experience with bed and bow is, um, it's not vast actually, uh, but it is, it is, I love it. I think it's one of the most amazing instruments. It's difficult in some ways. It's very simple in one, one way and it's very difficult in others. I'll tell you a quick story because I think it's, uh, you just, along those lines of you just never know. I was in New York years ago with my wife uh, before we had children. So this would have been probably 25 years ago now. <clears throat> and we were visiting one of her uh, friends from a long time ago, her childhood, who at this point was married to a Brazilian um, who didn't speak any English, really. Uh, he could say hello, and I can also say hello in Portuguese. And that's about the extent of it. Um, we were in a room together and the girls were in the other room talking and it was the most awkward silence you could ever imagine. He handed me a drink and we're drinking and there's no music, there's no TV, there was just this. Very awkward. And I'm thinking this could be a very long night. Um, and I'm in New York where there's lots of things happening. I'd rather be anywhere but right here. And I looked over in the corner of the room and there were a bunch of pieces of wood like this this size, and they had pieces of metal on them. And I saw beside them, there were a bunch of gourds on the floor and a few of these kashishi. And all I said was, bed and bow. And he lit up and he ran over to the side of the room, put one together for me. And when he handed it to me, he was even uh, more freaked out that I knew how to hold it. He handed me the stone, he handed me the stick, and he handed me a kashishi. And I kind of put it all in the right places and I just started playing. It's a very in different instrument because your pinky does a lot of the heavy lifting here. <laughs> that makes it super uncomfortable because we don't really work on our pinkies too much in the percussion world. But nonetheless, uh, he put two of them together. Uh, he did mine first and I was messing around. Then he 
started playing, and he was an expert at, at capoeira, actually. And then, more importantly, he was the Berenbau player. So, so the coordination of being able to push the stone into the actual piece of metal. You can also put the gourd against, I don't know if you can see this on this video, but you put it next to your stomach. For at least a couple of hours, we were in that room without saying a word to each other, and he took me through so many different rhythms on the bed and bow, and I was so, I was overjoyed. I mean, I was supposed to be there at that particular moment in time. No question in my mind that that was, uh, that was supposed to happen. Somebody's saying for to put this thing and get it out of my way, get it out of your way. Okay, now we're in Brazil. Let's start checking this stuff out. One of the smaller drums in Brazil is called the tamborim. And we're talking samba now, you guys. And we'll just show you a few techniques on this. Uh, love samba. Have yet to go to Brazil for carnival, but it's on my bucket list, the someday category. Uh, these drums, they're pretty powerful. And you might, in a, in a uh, bateria in Brazil, have 60 to 100 people playing just this drum. The technique on this can be very simple. Want to incorporate your fingers in the back there, or you can rotate the instrument. This drum pops. This drum really pops. Actually, it's a small, uh, very very small drum shell and a very tight head. This is a baqueta with many different strands, and that kind of adds to the quality of the sound. But that little rotating technique, you'll see a lot in Brazil. And it's incredibly uh, natural. I'm just going da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. And, and I turn the uh, tambourine uh, this way, it gets an upstroke. So that's the tambourine. Okay, that's the first of the bateria. Their snare drum there is called the Kaisha. Let me see if I can turn this so you can see the Kaisha. Sorry, there she is. All right, uh, it's a snare drum. A lot of times this drum could be played up here or it can be played down like a marching snare drum. I just have it over there so you can see it, but it's out of the way. Uh, the rhythm is very simple, 16th notes, duck together with accents, so. played in a carnival celebration one time where they were holding the drum up here and literally playing it with a traditional grip in the left hand like we would play a normal traditional grip but it was up here so they're playing it that way and hanging on to the drum at the back of their hand <laughs> a pretty cool technique one of the most um, important drums in the, the bateria would be this one and again this is such a small space uh, and once again Kaisha might be 50 to 100 of those playing at one time this is called the Hepanike. When I first, first wanted to um, build my Brazilian collection, I went into my buddy's shop, Earth Shaking Music. Dave Strohauer and his wife Lisa have the most incredible world percussion shop. And they have lots of other things there now too. But uh, nonetheless, I said, uh, I want to get a, uh, a Brazilian, uh, sort of all the drums I need for a bateria. He said, sure, I, I got what you need. I said, well, how about a, a Repanique? And he said, what? And I said, uh, 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 I'd seen the word, but I hadn't really tried to say it. It's Portuguese, you guys. So uh, he said, oh, you mean the Hepanique? <laughs> I said, okay. So that's this drum. It's a beautiful little drum, and it pops. No snares. Uh, use one stick and one hand. It's an African tradition with playing a uh, bar, playing with a stick and a hand. Uh, this, however, is a lot of metal, and the heads are usually, if not always, plastic these days. So they really pop, almost like a timbali sound, right, if you know that sound. But the hepanike literally calls everybody in, so you might hear this. Go, 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 and you'll have everybody else coming in. You call everybody in with this drum. So... Uh, 
again, multiple hepaniques in the Brazilian bateria. Okay, let's see where we're going to go from there. Let me show you the surdo because it's just an amazing, uh, big sounding John. If I can find my surdo mallet, uh, no, perfect John. Really? It's behind me. <laughs> the drum. And where the mallet ended up, I really don't know. So I'll probably have to improvise that now, and I'm sorry. Yeah, I had it here earlier. All right, I got one. Hang on. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so the Sordo, all off beats. Okay. Now, there was an amazing Brazilian percussionist. His name is Ayerto. And Ayerto Moreira, he actually plays... Uh, the surdo, if there's only one, if it's just him playing, and he'll do some off beats on the rim, so you get this sound. for those offbeats. So that's Ayerto's, Ayerto's uh, technique there. Okay, so let me find something here. These are Ago Go, and there are two bells. And you'll hear that a lot. But many Ago Go's have this technique potential. So there's a spring there, and they're kind of hooked together. So you can get a third note. And that third note is literally squeezing them together. Adds another little spice to that. Okay. Brings me to this beautiful little guy. This is a cuica. And the cuica is a friction drum. And the stick is inside. So there's a little, excuse me, a little button there. And... Um, it's a coffee can size drum. I have many. I've got a few up there that are bigger. Um, this drum, uh, like I said, friction drum, and you use a wet cloth, and you can put your thumb on the head to change the pitch. If I don't touch the pitch at all, I have this sound. If I want to pr apply pressure, again, in the bateria, you might have 50 to 100 of these playing, all in rhythm. So if your song is going by, boom, I was playing this in a school one day, and usually when you show that to a kid, elementary school kid, you'll go like this. So what's it sound like? And nine out of ten times they'll say, oh, it sounds like a monkey. And that's what it's supposed to sound like, a little howler monkey. And this one kid raised his hand, and I said, what, what do you think it sounds like? He goes, oh, that's a turkey. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> but I can see that. So, yeah, it sounds like a turkey call, if you think about it that way. Um, I'm jumping into a different location now. We're going into sound effects. And I used the quick in the core to take us there, a little monkey sound there. Uh, one of my students in my percussion mm -hmm. techniques class, who's now a Incredible educator out there, the string educator, David Metrio. He brought this back for me. He says, John, I brought you something. Uh, he was on, on holiday in South America. And uh, I said, what is that? He said, it's a Murano. And I said, well, it looks like it's, in, it's been built wrong. Uh, it's like a cuica, but in reverse. And he said, yeah, it's, it's a Murano. It's like little pig. So it's just a little fiction. But it's beautiful head and a little friction idea using the head as a resonant um, device. And, of course, the gourd is a chamber. So you never know, do you? So sound effects. Here we go, you guys. You ready? Jumping. Let me show you this one. This is a cowbell. I know I've already done cowbell, but this is... You'll appreciate this because I sure do. Uh, this is a beautiful Pete Engelhart. Uh, it looks like it's out of Nightmare on Elm Street or something. Just crazy the way it's designed. And when I found this in a shop, a little uh, shop that's, that's sadly closed now, Atlanta Pro Percussion, uh, the owner was there at Hambrick, and I played this bell. But it sounded like such a beautiful, high-pitched, gorgeous, handmade cowbell. And it has this odd shape right here. So I took it up to the front. It was, I forget what the price tag hanging off here was, but it was a lot. It was, for a bell like this, it might have been 80 bucks. And I was going to try to talk him down. 
And uh, he didn't want to have any part of that at that point. So uh, I just said, okay. And he goes, you don't even know why this is so interesting. I said, well, it's a great sounding bell. He said, let me see it. So he, he grabbed the bell. He put his hand on this little place right here where it kind of is concave and, and it just became a lot cooler. Um, I gave him what he wanted for it. Obviously, this was going home with me that day, no question. So, so sound effect wise, you just never know. I mean, you get an artist and an instrument designer onto something like this and you're going to end up with uh, something unique. And that's this is certainly that. So... Very cool sound effect sort of situation. Um, okay, let's see what else we have in a sound effect. Mm, let me show you this. So one of my students came up and said, uh, hey John, we need to have a marching machine. Uh, do we have anything? I said, no, no we don't. Um, but I mean, they're available, you can, you can purchase them. So he goes, well, we need it this week. We need, we need it tomorrow. And I was like, oh, that's great. So I look online. And I found sort of what they look like. This is a marching machine. It's just a bunch of uh, wooden. These are these are squares. Uh, these are two by twos that I sort of uh, just cut and I drilled them all out. I did this in one night, and the next day in rehearsal they had a marching machine. Uh, very interesting though, in that it sounds like a bunch of folks marching by. So you put that on a piece of wood there. That's the marching machine. This weird looking thing behind me here, let me show you. Uh, I'll pull it on and off so you can look at it. Again, someone required a percussionist to have a carriage bolt wind chime. And I had never heard of such a beast. And I said, I'm not even sure what that is. So I got online, I looked, and it's carriage bolts all strung together. I used an old bongo frame that I had and went to Lowe's and got the deluxe carriage bolts. And they literally sound awesome. I mean, it's it's not a wind chime at all. They're, they're their own sound. And the long ones and the short ones, they all have different pitches, obviously, the way the sound works. And uh, it ended up being quite a fine. We use it in many, many things in our, uh, in our time at KSU. Okay, here's something else. Um, always on the lookout, and you never know where you're going to find stuff. I was in a wine store in Blue Ridge, Georgia. My wife and I are in there uh, on one of our uh, anniversary trips and we're just looking at wines and I see a little bag with this in it. Why, I don't know. I knew what it was, I'd seen them before. I haven't seen them in years though. It's um, a little drum, a little skin head, beautifully made by the way. I'm not sure where this came from. I did, didn't have an identification on it whatsoever. A little stick and a piece of fishing line and on this stick is rosin, what you would use to, to uh, put on a bow to play a string instrument. But when you spin this, <laughs> it's got one of the best insect sounds you'll ever hear, even sometimes better than insect sounds. All right, this little drum is interesting. Now we're into sound effects now, and we're going to jump all around in the course of this this video. And by the way, this is one of the most fun things that I get to do. Just come in and play all the weird sounds. And if I have an audience, it's all the better. I guess you're my audience, but nonetheless, even if I didn't, I'd probably be in here doing this. This is a water phone. It's, uh, it's got an end that's open and it's got a chamber down here that I have put some water in. Not a lot, just a little bit of water. And it's got these little pieces of metal that are welded on uh, different lengths. And that's what the purpose. You use a bass bow and you bow it. Listen to this sound. It's like the sound you've heard before in horror movies. Like why you couldn't sleep after watching that movie and you weren't sure why. Uh, interesting sounds. That's a water phone. Okay. Let me show you this awesome thing. So, this little drum. And this is given to me, given to us. I, I, I want to say us. I leave it at Kennesaw. Um, one of my retired colleagues, the sweetest woman on the planet, Barbara Hammond, walked up to me one day during one of my students' uh, recital juries, actually, 
uh, and she had a little bag and this drum was in it. This is a chakra drum and it's, uh, it's just the most incredible sounding drum. Let me see if I can get it to where you can see it. There we go, that'll work. And little rubber hammers, uh, little rubber mounts came with it. sound and you can experiment with the sound. <laughs> anyway, I leave this in the studio at Kennesaw in case anybody ever needs to like sort of zen out. <laughs> they can use this and it works pretty well. All right, so that's a little shocker drum. Thanks to Barbara Hammond, my lovely friend. This is mm, also very joyous. This is a crystal ball. Years and years and years ago, my uh, my wife, when we were just dating, got this for me for Christmas. And Tibetan singing bowl. Same idea as far as the friction and rubbing it. This one though has a lot of pitches inside it. Check this out. This is made by the monks. This is uh, a lot of different alloys. In fact, talking to the experts um, on Tibetan bowls, if you will, um, this has seven different alloys and the monks in Tibet, uh, and at least what this fellow told me, was they will only put two of the alloys together on a full moon. So it takes multiple cycles of the moon to get enough alloys to make the bowl and actually hammer it into the bowl. Uh, so there's seven alloys that they put together for this uh, and then hammered it, uh, what seemingly would be haphazard, but I bet not. Check this out. All the pitches here, and I get kids to sing this when I do a science and math show with our percussion trio. I'll play this. You can get a thousand kids or so to sing. Now, when I play that into a mic, the kids are all like, uh, 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 uh. All these different notes are coming out, and it's hilarious because everyone's got a different take on what they're hearing. But as soon as you actually rub this drum, this is what happens. There's the note that comes out. Then I get all the kids to sing that note, and they do it successfully. That's an A. And here's what it started as it's in there, right? But it's just not as prevalent as you think. So that's a singing bowl. The idea for the glass, crystal glass, and the singing bowl, uh, crystal bowl, I should say, uh, is the same idea that we've probably all done since we were very little. And uh, that's rubbing the crystal with a wet finger. Uh, and maybe what you don't know is what will happen if you move the water. Some of you do know this, I'm sure of it accidentally happened to me one day where we're playing this sort of spacey sounds in our percussion uh, show and I tripped over a piece of carpet and as I'm playing this walking to another station the bend the, the pitch bent and I was like what just happened what was that and I was luckily I didn't fall and uh, you know break the glass but what did happen was when you move the water you morph the sound check it out So I wrote a piece of music entitled Crystal and um, had 28 glasses around a room with different chords and we bent the pitches into one another. So there's limitless possibilities with, with bending water in a glass like that. And it ends up being such a super, super neat idea as far as uh, um, being able to morph one, one pitch into the other. So speaking of bowls, um, <laughs> these are just mixing bowls, okay? Um, Joseph Schwantner, amazing composer, came and spent a little time with Kennesaw Wind Ensemble. He, he had written a uh, concerto for four percussionists. And when I was assembling the uh, materials to be able to play this, uh, this piece, each percussionist was to have a mixing bowl. Not a big deal. It's always part of our collection. But he specified Tavolo. Uh, Tavolo mixing bowl. And I'm thinking, oh, Mr. Schwander, seriously, does it matter? And I go into our bed, bath, and beyond near Kennesaw, and I'm looking at bowls, and I'm looking all down through, and the guy walks up, says, can I help you? 
And I said, well, I'm looking for mixing bowls, and obviously I've found all of your mixing bowls here, but I'm looking for a specific one, Tovolo, and he goes, yeah, they're up top. <laughs> Oh, and they were like right there. So I pulled one down and all the rest of the bowl sounded pretty interesting and what you'd expect, this didn't. It was like, you're kidding me. I've got a dozen of these things. They have a perfect sound. They have that sound and he knew it. Joseph Schwantner knew exactly what he wanted. So I bought what they had at Tavola Bowls and when... Uh, Mr. Schwartner was here. He was very, very happy that we had the right bowls. Um, using one of those bowls, I want to show you what happened one time in a studio session. I was lucky that when I bought um, a vibraphone from a studio in town here, Master Sound Studio, they threw in a box of uh, whistles and different sound effect things, and this was one of them. This is actually a boat whistle, and I, you know, it's one of those things where you think, I'd love to have that. I'll never use it, but I'll take it. But it's got a great sound. I mean, it's a boat whistle. It sounds, it's just an Acme. I think it's probably from the 1920s or 30s. I mean, this is the real deal. I was doing a session one day um, for a, a composer, and he had this jingle that was, was happening. And um, he told me that. And I had a bag of stuff. This was actually in the bag. I don't really know why and, and until, you know, this happened, obviously. I also had this with me. And this is um, an ocean drum. You've probably all seen something about this. This is a large one. But you know, the seeds inside. Makes the sound of the ocean. And here was my, here was my task. He says, here's what we need, John. We need the sound of like the San Francisco, like a bay. And I've been there and I remember hearing like the buoys and since you know you don't want to hit them with your boat they have bells inside of them things that ring and uh he says we need to have that that sort of aura that sort of um soundscape if you will so i i'm like well let me see what i can do so he opened the mics okay? so here's what I, did. I put the, the bow whistle in my mouth and i had the ocean drum and i had um a bowl <laughs> check it out It was literally you can stop, stop. It was literally the perfect sound that they were looking for. What I didn't know at the time was it was for rice and roni, the San Francisco treat, and they just wanted to have that sound of uh, of a misty morning in San Francisco Bay with boats going by. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that was the sound. So I had to use the bowl to get those sounds. Yeah, I know. It's the simple stuff, isn't it? Okay, we're jumping pretty pretty uh, fast through stuff. Did I get to all the uh, sound effects? Probably so, probably so. Okay, we're gonna jump into another category. Hope you're ready. This is gonna go a little bit long, by the way. It probably already has. Yeah, let me have to splice me up. Uh, these are Oslato. The authentic ones look like this, Senegalese. And they're just, uh, there's a ball and another ball, and they have seeds inside, and those are actual little little nuts. And um, I think they are, some kind of a natural, organic, um, uh, whatever, sphere in Africa. And it has seeds inside, so attached by a string. These are more production, but same sort of thing. What I wanna show you is this, and if you wanna look it up, Oslato, start, starts with an O, and uh, there are literally competitions around the world now of people that have perfected this technique. It's extra again, I'll practice this for a long time. But there's you can use it as a shaker. Or when I let the balls release and they go over my hand. You can get as creative as you want with these. And, and wait, wait till you see some of the techniques they do. I won't go more into those because I really don't have much more going on. I show people uh, a two against three rhythm using these. And that works out pretty well to, to blow their mind. Um, okay, let's go. 
I'm going to take you into Africa now, and we're going to do a bunch of drums, and uh, we'll go that way. This is Shaker Egg, made by a friend of mine, uh, Maureen LaFrance, we call her Mo. Uh, I've received this from her, um, commissioned her to build it, actually. I've got five or six of her Shaker Eggs, and have loved them all. This one I've had for, uh, gosh, 25, 28 years, maybe. Got a low note. And the gig with uh, the Shaker Rays is you want to control the net. So what one of my teachers said was, it's actually like you're pouring water out of the gourd. So, the Shaker Rays, you want to combine those sounds. You got uh, 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 and then uh, 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 uh. So, uh, uh, uh. And it kind of dances between your fingers there. Once you get moving, you don't really let, let go of this hand ever. But you can back and forth it. So that's one of my shake rays from Mo. And another one is a little bit larger. Uh, again. This way too. It's one of those things again that you can work on a lot uh, to get your technique going on the shake array. Look that up if you want to take it deeper. Um, and they're so much fun. That's another instrument that makes you look very silly until you actually figure out how to play it in time. This one I uh, got when I was on a symphony tour with Atlanta Symphony in New York. A place called Drummer's World had them. And they were kind of in the back. You had to request these. These as well as the uh, Venezuelan maracas. Uh, you couldn't just walk in and see them on the floor. And I went in and I said, uh, I understand you have some uh, handmade tail shaker race from a lady in Queens. Someone had told me to ask for that. And he walked around to the back and came out with these. I, I bought two at the time. They're very delicate. They're glass beads. Uh, very small gourd, as you can see. And the technique here is not... <laughs> like the bigger shaker egg. Now this one, you just play back and forth. Like you're playing 16 notes hand to hand. You can accent in. Uh, uh, uh. It's just a beautiful, beautiful, delicate sound. Okay, so there's the shaker ray, the tail shaker ray, the bigger shaker rays. I have a drum here called a talking drum. You've probably all seen that. It's an hourglass shape. Um, uh, different places in the world. This one's actually from Senegal. Uh, the stick is curved. You play it under here. You can also play it with your hand to change the pitch. This one's unique in that it's a snakeskin head. And I've got a bunch of I've got a bunch of talking drums right there on top of my cabinet. Um, and when we found this one in North Carolina, my wife said, "Do we need another talking drum?" I said, well, we sort of do, because this one is different than all of my other ones in that it has the snakeskin heads. So I, I wanted to have, uh, I see Senegal, this is Nigerian. Uh, I wanted to have a, um, an authentic talking drum. It's very simple. It's an hourglass shape, two heads attached, and the heads are snakeskin. So yes, we did need another talking drum. This is a log drum, and you could say that it looks like a log because it's made of a log. Um, this one is also Nigerian. It's a piece of Baduk, actually. It's got a wonderful sound. Authentic uh, feeder for that, just gum rubber on a stick. So that's my log drum. Let's do some drum drums. Okay, I'm gonna show you this. Actually, let me tell you what happened. Um, several years ago, a Ghanaian professor came to spend some time at KSU, um, teach different classes, but work with our percussion ensemble. John Wesley Danqua, a dear, dear friend, and one of the sweetest souls you'll ever meet. Um, he brought, as his luggage, now that sounds a little weird, uh, four drums. These are called kete. And the Kete drums, I only have two in my studio here. I went to Kennesaw and grabbed them so I could put them in this video for you. These live at KSU. Um, these are not my personal collection. These are, these are KSU's drums. And I'll tell you that in a moment. He came to work with us. And um, 
when I went after he showed up, and again, the the first time he's ever left Ghana, first time ever on an airplane, was to come to Kennesaw State to spend an entire semester with us and the students there, um, both the world music students and more importantly the percussion students, being that was his specialty. Um, and he brought these drums, and they were literally bound together with a handle so he could carry two at a time. And that's what he lugged from Ghana to New York to Atlanta and then a bus up to Kennesaw. And, uh, and they're gorgeous. These are royal. Uh, the Kete family, this particular pattern is, uh, is very, very special. Uh, this is one of the midsize, and the largest drum is this one. And it's a monster. If you can imagine lugging these uh, as your luggage. And they had two and two. So this one was wrapped up with the smallest one, and the, the, the medium-sized ones were wrapped together. And when I questioned it, I said, so, John, um... You didn't bring a change of clothes? Or you didn't bring anything else other than these drums? He says, well, I, I knew I could get clothes at Kennesaw. I, I knew I couldn't get Kete drums, and I wanted you to have Kete drums. So, uh, super special. So, the biggest drum, which kind of controls the show, and when we did our drumming um, uh, evening of percussion, with John Wesley and all of us learned traditional Ghanaian songs and rhythms and we had a blast. Uh, he played this drum. These are the sticks you use on the biggest drum. And uh, I thought from the get-go that he was going to just completely pulverize the head and how are we going to replace that head. It's still good to this day. <laughs> These, as you can see, are just uh, uh, <laughs> a limb <laughs> with a joint in it where you have, uh, where you just cut it off. It's where the, the two limbs come together. And that's the traditional stick for this drum. The other drum, smaller one, has an interesting technique. Um, let me pull this one out of the way. In that you literally, you play it with sticks. You can see how this head has been sort of... Uh, hit on quite a bit, and you play it not only just like this, you would literally lock the stick onto the head. So really different technique for most of us that have been playing um, either hand drums or drummed with sticks for a long time to get that technique was, was actually quite difficult for some of my people. Uh, this drum, actually, let me show you another drum from Ghana. If I can get to it, I'll move the, the kit tape somehow. Let's do this. And I'm gonna pull this drum over. This drum has become over the years one of my favorite drums. It's called the Bobobo, and you can see it. It's a big, it's a big drum. And I'll leave the kete right there, just kind of like beside us for friendship. Uh, the bobobo is a low drum. You can lift the drum with your feet to get like the opening sound on the bottom there. But the bobobo is one of the larger drums of the Panologo family. And I have one of the smaller ones somewhere here, if I can locate it. There it is. And what I want to do now is sort of show you how this became. Here's the smaller drum of the Pond Logo family. Again, it has this, the, the pegs there for tuning. And if you can look at the shape of this drum, not so much the carving, but the shape, it's, it's very similar to a conga drum uh, that we're used to, a Latin, Latin American uh, the shape of that is very, very similar. However, a conga is usually a stave drum. This is a, a single piece that's carved. That brings me almost to my uh, ending here with the congas. Uh, let me show you one thing. Oh, I'm going to put this back there. See what I mean? It's just like one of those places where there's just no space for all of my friends here. This is my favorite djembe, and this is a West African. This drum came from Mali, and we're gonna get into a little bit of technique at the end here, and I'm gonna sign off. 
this is made by a company called Kangaba, and I feel like it's one of the best makers of, of uh, as far as a production of this drum. They're all handmade, obviously. Uh, I put this head on because the original head blew on me, but I, I then I got to really put some love uh, into the drum. It takes, you know, maybe 12 hours to get a head on. Because, I mean, you're going, you're, you're literally weaving everything by hand straight across. So, in the goat skin, you have to shave it, the whole thing. So... It makes me smile. It makes me very happy. I'm going to run straight into a conga drum here now, and we're going to call it a day. I want to show you a couple of techniques. This is one of my favorite conga drums in my collection. It's literally, uh, again, I'm lucky that I get to do what I do. And as I start collecting things, uh, I strive to find the best thing that I could find on the planet. And that's what this is. This is a Giovanni Hidalgo. Uh, a galaxy LP makes it you won't get it better. It's it's ash. I mean the the wood is is just uh, I just feel like it's royal. I just love it. So and this is straight on technique on hand drums djembe's um, the bobobo the pan logo You don't want to hurt yourself. There's a lot of metal here. There's a lot of wood here This head versus the djembe head. This is water buffalo. It's very thick uh, it's going to be around a long time. The, uh, the djembe heads are made from goat, and they're quite a bit thinner. Technique, though... You want to perfect your sound, so your tone and your slap and your heel-toe sounds, you want to work on all those. Let me show you how not to hurt yourself, and that'll be the last thing we do here. So, what one of my very, very uh, most important teachers on, on the conga, his name uh, is Luis Stefanel, the Colombian. And uh, when I was at Georgia State teaching, uh, I was also going over to his house um, once a week to take lessons. And, um, and I, felt, I felt wide open. I felt like it was, it, he changed everything that I thought about all of hand drums uh, with just a few sentences, but nonetheless, what he said here was that your setup, you want to get as much hand as possible making your tone uh, happen. So between your thumbs, first joint and where it connects to your hand, put the rim of the drum, not the counter hoop, but the rim of the drum right in between there. That allows you a lot of a lot of meat, if you will, you know, your hand, even though I don't have any big hands. Okay, so there's my tone. And if you'll notice, my arm is kind of rigid right here. I'm using my, my stroke is here. It's not a really uh, wristy stroke, it's arms. And that's important because when you go to make a slap happen, now most people when they do slap song conga, they hurt themselves. They're doing a slap and their thought is it's a velocity change and you really have to slam into the drum. You don't. A slap is a technique, not a velocity. I've said it to my students. Uh, that was told to me. I said it to my students. You will, you will save yourself a lot of uh, pain, a lot of hurt. So watch this. I'm going to play some tones, and I'm going to change my technique a little bit. My tone is going to be like this. When I go to play a slap, I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to let my wrist open up, and I'll let my fingers relax. And that's where the slap will occur. Check it out. Here's a tone. Here's a slap. Tone. Slap. Okay. Control your sounds. Tones, slap, bass notes, those are simple. Just relax. And your heel toe. So the basic sounds are what you're going for. Okay, and that's without hurting yourself. 
hopefully that'll give you insight to when you uh, <laughs> are going to actually play some hand instruments. I hope you do get a chance to do that. Um, that's kind of the, the morning um, of my studio. You know, all that stuff is here. There's, as I wish you could see around. There's parameters of stuff all over that I haven't touched. And I, I'm kind of like, oh, shoot, I didn't talk about that. I didn't talk about that. We didn't get to that. But that's okay. We've, we've, we've done a, a, a few things here. And hopefully you've uh, enjoyed spending time with me. I've certainly enjoyed. The only thing better would have been if we could have been together. And then we could just chat and talk and play. I always allow people to... Uh, treat it like it's mine, but have fun. You can experiment with the sounds on, on these instruments. So if you have questions about anything, I bet you'll be able to contact me uh, through KSU. I'd be more than thrilled to, to chat with you um, online or what have you about anything you might have a question on um, or a statement or whatever. And I hope that, um, that this has been fun. As fun for you as it has been for me. We'll put it like that, okay? Um, maybe we'll do it again, like round two. So I hope you have a good rest of the summer. I believe it's June 5th today when you're watching this. And uh, hopefully things are easing up with our uh, uh, world and everyone's getting back to what might be a, a normal situation before long. And hopefully we're all back in the fall into our normal environments. I wish that for everybody. Um, so anyhow, this has been a great, a great joy of mine to present this to you and uh, take good care. Thanks for tuning in.